Sure, if we need to. All right. Oh, hey, Julia. Julia's, uh, so Emma's in Berlin and Julia's in London. Good to see everybody today. Hi, Julia. Hello, Julia. Um, okay, so let me spotlight this video. So if you're following along with me today, we're going to be painting this, oops, this watercolor scene. We'll probably try and stick as close to this colors as possible. But as always, we're going to, of course, start with the drawing. And I'd like to start with the black and white so that you can, you're, you're more attuned to the values, right? The lightness or darkness of the color. Now, I don't think this drawing is too difficult, so I'm not going to suggest a grid. But I am going to suggest that we make one or two measurements. And that measurement is, I want us to, okay, how do I describe this? So I want you to find the vertical distance, right? Which you're going to define on your own, in your own paper. And I want you to evaluate how, if, if the vertical distance is this tall, how does the width compare to the vertical distance? To do this. So I'm kind of working around a camera. So let's see. So this is the width where the blue mark is. And if I line it up here and I come right here, I can see that it's about one, two, three, four. It's about one fifth, like four fifths of the way up to the, the vertical distance. So when I, before I start sketching this out, I'm going to determine with the dot here and a dot here, right? How kind of long I want my vertical distance, where I want my vertical distance to be. And then this distance here is going to be my, um, my horizontal distance. Got it? I'm kind of measuring. And if I want to, I can also check one, two, and about a third. Oh, look what I did. I didn't do that right. About a third of the, about a third of the boat is on this side of the vertical distance, and the other two thirds are on this side. So before you start, and Jonathan, are you on the, um, are you in our WhatsApp thread? Uh, I downloaded the app. I don't know what to do. With, I've never okay. used it before, so I don't know. I'm going to email you very quickly a link uh, that you should open on your phone and just click on and it'll bring you in. So Fantastic. Thanks. Do that. Um, do that be, let's get all the tech stuff out of the way. Um, let's see here. Try a watercolor. Light Wyoming. Okay. What's your email address? It's M O N J E E K. Got it. Okay. Right now. So all you need to do is open that email from your phone, click on the link, and you should be with us. Cool. All right. So the first thing I want you guys to do before anything else is to show me where you're planning. Let's see. So this is like here. My boat. So we're kind of juggling to, oh, that's too far. I'll get it. So I know that my vertical distance has to be no more than this. Whoops. Right? Here's my top. Sorry, my vertical distance is this. I know my horizontal distance is less. And I know that one third of my horizontal distance is on this side of the line and two thirds is on this side of the line. So I'm going to now try to center it. Let's see. So if the full distance, you might have to fiddle around with this a little bit. The full distance is here, one, two, three. Yep. So I have one. So here is my, I want to see your points before you start drawing. Just so that I know we've got like things in the right places. 
And then of course, the first lines we're gonna do, we're not focusing on any detail, right? At this beginning area, we are focusing just on the outer shapes. Um, and you can choose whether or not you want this dude in your picture. I guess it will, I guess it will look weird if the boat is driving itself, but I don't know. I don't think you really need to have the person in, but you'll get to make that decision. So we're starting with this bigger shape. These bigger, these blue lines. And I'm going to send a picture of this so you can see it. And because we know, you know, that like the thing that tends to go, sorry, I'm still trying to position this so you guys can see it. So you can see I have my, my vertical distance. I have about where my horizontal distance is. And then I have my horizontal, my, my horizontal distance, one third on this side, and two thirds on this side. And I know that's a pain in the neck, but you know, the great thing about it is if you get this stuff right, you're less likely to have problems later on. Let me send this across so you can see this. If you can't and see the video later, um, obviously will, these photos will all be included. Uh, Jonathan, also the other thing you need to know is these are all recorded classes. So everything gets recorded. All of the, the photo sources get uh, edited in and that's all available. Any class that I teach is available to you for free as a recording. So. If you miss one, you don't have to pay for it. You can just go online and get it. So once you do that, if you want to, you can use, where's my pencil here? If you want to, you can use a, um, so now I have my points, by the way, right? It's easier. If you want to, you can use a ruler. Or you could try to freehand it. Um, so this is Looks good, Tosh. Also, as always with these things, and notice sort of here towards the end, the boat is a little sort of curves up a little bit. As always with this stuff, um, I don't want you to feel rushed. You may or you may not finish the project, but the idea behind this is that you've been walked through the steps enough and seen the process, so you're pretty much good to go on your own. But don't rush yourself. Like if you're feeling like, okay, I tend to go fast, and the reason I go fast, the reason I go fast is that I want to get through so I can then, you know, work with you guys. That's my goal. So since your job is not to work with the other students, don't worry so much about trying to keep up with me. Work at your own pace. So now I'm doing this outer sail line so that I can get. these lines in. And if I'm, I can continue to check. Right, like how far up is this if I were to measure it on this vertical line? This is probably about one fifth. So one, you know, so I don't wanna go any farther up this line here that I'm drawing in. I may not get everything exactly right on the first go. Yeah, like I think my sales actually a little bit more this way. But if I have these parameters, I'm less likely, I'm, it's easier for me to correct. Okay. So notice I'm correcting as I go along and kind of carving out 
So that's the hardest thing to, I think, train yourself into is this idea that you're going to need, you're going to lay it down and then correct it later. And so we're trying to make our corrections more manageable. It's not about getting it right the first time. It's literally about how do I, how do I set this up so that it, so that it were, you know, I have this option to fix things as I need to. Well, there we go. So here's the kind of beginning. And now I can start to sketch in the boat. Notice how little detail I still have right here. Yeah, maybe I'll put in the shape of the guy. I'm going to decide later whether I want him in, but I'm going to include him in that shape. Oh, he's got like a little windmill thing on the back. Right, and then well, it looks like he's got a second boat on here. Oops. Boats are tricky, as you'll find. They look simple. They got more going on than it appears. That looks pretty good. And then my second set of lines. Only real problem for me in this is having to work. Kind of having to work. Around this second monitor. I will survive. Don't feel sorry for me. The same. It's a little awkward. Um, so this is like how simple that first drawing looks. Let's see. Sent me. Gosh, looks good. Let's see, Rosh. Hey, rush me. Your boat is too far on this side. So this is the line. Right? Look at this is the line. I didn't really sketch this in, so I want you to look at this. This is the line coming down the center. Right down where the mast is. On this side is one third. On this side is two thirds. And this should not be higher than this. Right? So this distance has to match coming up to here. And also one third is here and two thirds are here. Okay. And that's the thing this. It's good for us to like check, right? For us to remember. I don't know, my boat's a little bit tall here, so I'm probably going to bring this down a bit. I'm going to, I know this kind of comes at an angle a little bit more. There we go. And, you know, even I'm not like getting it right on the first go. And I very intentionally am not practicing this because I want you guys to see what the real artistic process is, which is a tremendous amount of correcting. Um, it's more about like setting up a system so that where failure is a part of it, right? Like, so you try, then you evaluate, you have things to evaluate. Like I could just be for Rashmi's drawing, right? To help her get to where she needs to be faster. There's kind of a little shadow here. What direction is the light coming from, by the way? Can anybody tell? Is it behind? 
Yeah, it's kind of behind and to the right, right? Because of this bit. And you're right, because the shadow is kind of going this way. Yep. Behind and a little to the right. Good job. And this is how simple the drawing is at this point. Once I get these basic shapes in, then I can start adding in more detailed shapes. Catch them out first so you can see them, and then we'll start drawing them. So it's really easy to get completely obsessive about details way too early in the process. So part of this walking through is I'm showing you what not to obsess about. Don't obsess about this thing. The, the man, don't obsess about him. You're gonna forget about him completely <laughs> as we go through this process. Leah, is it fine now? Then I'll start drawing. Hold on, let me check. Give me a second. I'm gonna give you a little bit more. And then the other thing you guys are going to be starting to sketch are the sort of uh, are the light area. You're going to sort of sketch out the light area. So right in here, in here. That's probably all we're going to sketch. There you go. So if you can see the red lines, that's what's that's what's next. Let me see. Okay. So your vertical distance is here. Yep, one, two, perfect. Absolutely perfect. Perfecto. You don't have to show me this. I'm not gonna make anybody show me this, but if you want to, I won't tell you later, hey, guess what? <laughs> Everything is off. If we can fiddle around with these shapes in these beginning stages, it makes it so much easier. And um, one of the things I wanna mention here is uh, a, a, a dude, we in America we have this cartoon called Dilbert, which is about office life. So the guy who writes it is a guy named Scott Adams, and he wrote a book called How to Succeed While Failing at Everything. Failure. He does not believe in goals. He does not believe in because goals are things that you reach, you work really hard to reach, and then you feel empty afterwards. He believes in systems in which failure is a part. So. This system of drawing the envelope of shape allows us to start to sketch things in, see did I get it right, and make the adjustments simply. So failure is always part of the equation, right? I think I've got it right and I don't quite have it right. Um, so, but he believes in systems for setting things up so that it's easier. And I really like that as a concept. I'm like, I like the idea that I expect failure as part of my artistic process. Then I don't freak out so much when it happens, right? I don't beat myself up. You know, the very beginner wants to start over. Let's see. Uh, Julie, I I think your boat is too, it's too short on this side. So I don't know if you heard my instruction at the beginning. So once again, this distance is about four fifths of the way, the vertical distance is about four fifths of the way up your, sorry, the horizontal distance is about four fifths of the way up your vertical distance. Your boat looks too short to me. So remeasure that, right? And then furthermore, it's one third, one third, one third, right? So there's one third on this side of the mask, it's two thirds on this side of the mask. Yeah, it's too short. Okay, let's see, Emma. Emma, I, I think I'm gonna say the same thing to you. Hold on, let me check it again. Nope, you're good. And one, two, three. I think you need to extend this just a little bit on this side, Emma. You need to extend it out just a little bit further than you have it. So notice your tendency. That's your left brain getting in your way. Okay, let's see, Jim. Let's quickly, one, two, three. One, 
So John, your uh, vertical, your horizontal distance is too short. If you look, you'll see yours comes up to about almost halfway, halfway up the mass, right? And really this vertical distance should come up to here. Do you see what I'm saying with that? It's no. Short, right? So, so it's too short or too long? Yeah, it, this needs to be longer. The horizontal the needs to be longer. So the horizontal line, your boat, your boat bed is too short. Okay. I think. Hold on, I'm gonna look at it. Oh, you know what? Never mind. Hold on. I'm looking at it again. No, it's good. I'm sorry. You're right. No, that's wait. about all the room I have on the paper. It's anyway. good. It's good. It's good. No, nope, you're good. Never mind. You're good. Sorry, I mismeasured. Sometimes on these smaller ones, it's trickier to see. Good job. All right. So once you're in. Now you can start adding, right? Your horizon line here. And then notice that the sail buckles in a little bit actually here on this side. And then there's a kind of a, that's like too much. Does buckle, but not that much. Notice how easy it is to do things too. So we're just highlighting these. These are the major light and dark shapes we've got going. <laughs> There's this cute little windmill here. Love that. You can also just use a motor. I know that some of my lines are blocking more detail. There's a railing here. Job, you guys, you're doing great. If you want to, you can add in these lines too that kind of go at a diagonal. This is all stuff that's pretty good to do. I would, I'm probably going to skip the numbers. I don't think that's as interesting. And this is a thing that you'll notice about painting, right? We are going to make decisions all the time about what to keep in and what not to keep in. I like these lines because they kind of show the direction that the sails are going. They look straight, but they aren't. Right? They're kind of more at a diagonal. And they'll probably help give our boat a little texture. Let's see. Annika, let me double check here. I think that's good. This looks too wide to me, Annika, but let me double check on it. <laughs> Shade it when that, so you're, uh, can you do me a favor and take another picture of it? I can't oh. see it rotate. It's driving me, sorry. I should oh, be, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't even yeah. realize I had it. So I can just look at it from the- Wait, oh. so hey, too, huh? Okay, yes. So yours, Annika, is too wide. You will notice that your horizontal is exactly the same height as your vertical. Yeah. So you need to trim that back. Okay. Yep. You went too wide. And my sense is from the back. Look at how, look at the space between the outer uh, rigging line here and the sail, right? If this line is any sort of wide, if this space is any wider than here, then you know you're off somehow. Yeah. Right. Got that. Dark. So I'll, I'll yeah. That was the same, so I'll correct it. I'll correct it. Yeah, that's what it's for. Oh, thank you. Yep, yep, definitely it's too wide. So you see your 
your sail looks you've made your sail wider to accommodate mm -hmm. how wide you've made. Yeah. It's all right. It's how we see it's very easy to fix it at this stage, right? Yeah. Thank you, by the way. I appreciate it. Everyone's, you know, it's funny. Normally I'm not bad at the tech stuff, but when I'm teaching the art, it's sometimes I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I just can't like seem to to parse those two sides of my brain. Um, I'm going to send over a copy of this boat with the simple drawing lines, and then I'm going to put this one up here just so that because I noticed that some of my lines are are blocking, and I want you to be able to see. We need to be able to see what's going on. So like kind of right here, there's a there's a boat. I don't know if you can see it. Kind of like a, a little bit in the light, mostly in the dark. I mean, I'm almost I'm figuring out what these things are. Second, first I'm looking for the dark and the light spaces. So as I see those things, sometimes I can figure out what a thing is. Sometimes I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter if I know what it is or not. In fact, sometimes it's like super helpful if I don't know what it is. Then I'm just focused on the shape and I'm not so worried about whether it looks like an X. That's when we start to get into trouble in drawing, right? Is when we want it to look like the thing in our minds and not the thing that it, not how that thing exactly looks. There's this kind of canopy here. I, so I'm getting a bit of detail in just because it's a little bit easier to see here. I'll send it over in a certain form. And yeah, I don't know, I'm feeling the dude. So I'm gonna put in just an outline of the dude, not too much. And I've got like a little railing here, maybe one or two, not too much, but a little bit. There's these kind of neat circular things. There's a line. Here, I'm gonna send the detail of the book so that you can see it. All right, gosh. Um, hmm. I feel, oh uh, yeah, Tosh, your boat is too long, right? So your boat, should be up to here. The width, the ver the 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 width of your boat, the horizontal distance should be up to here. Oh, okay. Goes up to here. Which is why you're having problems making those sails fit. So yeah. once you get this correct, you're gonna wanna adjust your sails so they aren't so wide. Okay. Notice how that happens. Isn't that funny? So you're probably looking at it and thinking something was wrong, but you're not quite sure what it was, right? Definitely. Yeah. All right, I'm going to send this over to you so we can, I'm going to send you guys the detail of the, of what's happening kind of on the top of the boat so you can add as much detail as you want. I'll send you what I've done. Here we go. All right. And here's where mine is at. I think this is okay. I'm looking to see if there's any major shifts in value. Notice I haven't colored anything in. If things are dark, I haven't colored them in. I'm just outlining them. So About here in the water, I see a slightly darker line kind of modifying things. So basically, as we move up the, up the canvas of the paper, we're moving away, right, farther away. Um, and usually that's characterized by a slight shift in value. I can see it here, mostly.
I think that's where I'm going to now. I'm going to do one or two more things. Let's see. This head comes a little bit above the scale. This comes out here. It's pretty simple shapes, actually. There's a kind of a butter coming out here. Maybe too big. Notice how much you make things too big. Notice that. Notice it. Because that is the, and notice I'm doing it too. This is not something you're ever immune from. You just have to be aware that you do it and then be aware that it's probably something you're going to need to correct. My person is kind of like just a cylinder, a circle, and a set of curved and straight lines. It's not really, he kind of looks like a bug right now. All right, here's where I'm at. And we will almost always spend the first hour drawing. Right, so although this is a painting class, it's the drawing that people often need to work with. Diana and Sandra, of course, send across whatever you're working on. As I said, I'm really encouraging um, people to uh, come to class and you don't have to do the assignment. You can be finishing an assignment from last week. You can have a special project you wanna do. Um, and, if, you know, and if you want instruction and, you know, help and direction on how to get started. I will help you with that too. Ah, Claudia, that looks good. Yep. John looks good. This is coming up a little high. Well, actually, you know what? You're right. I'm going to bring mine down. Okay. Get your shadow of your boat in. So that's a little darker here. Also, there's a couple of light areas. If you're fully working, in um, in watercolor today, you're going to want to preserve these white areas. If you have a little gouache or a little white watercolor in a tube, you might be able to add some of these white shapes in. This so these are like the white swells. I was just thinking about this. Gotcha. There's certain things, so you can either you can kind of spell them out. Oh, Sandra. <laughs> so are you going to work to darken his uh, mouth and... Um, I think the body is too dark, but I can't lighten it up now. Uh, why don't you add a little gouache on top? Oh, no, I don't want to do it because I, I worked a lot in a kind of transparent thing. Okay. And wet on wet, so... Okay, that's better, Tosh. I feel like, let's see, one. I feel like this uh, boat comes down a little bit lower and the sails come down a little bit lower. So just bring your sails down a little bit lower. Oh, okay. Uh, Julia, much better. Good job. Yeah, so those of you who are just working straight watercolor, is anybody doing acrylic this morning? Everybody's doing quarter. Is, is that the acrylic instead of gouache? 
my suggestion was that as we I know you guys are sick. I know a lot of you've been doing watercolor a long time. So I'm going to start the next four weeks. I'm going to be doing watercolor and then adding gouache in. Right. But starting in September, our classes are going to be you can go either direction. The demos are going to be done in gouache and you can either use watercolor, gouache or acrylic. Gouache is actually a perfect beginning. It's not like acrylic. It's it's more like watercolor, but it has more layering capacities. So it's a great demo. So yeah, I'm just encouraging you to work with whatever medium you want to, because we've been in watercolor for a long time. However, the demo is gonna be in watercolor, mostly with some gouache touch-ups, because we can. Is gouache a new medium? I, I, yeah, gouache is a new medium. I'll talk to you about it. Um, so, Rashmi, this still feels a touch. Oh, the boat is up too high. The, you have the boat body up too high. Look how low that is. Okay. So bring your boat body down. It's down lower also. Otherwise, it's in good shape. The thirds are there. So you just need to bring all of this business, like this line down. And then all this business comes down to it. See that there's an actual space here. Look at this. Pay attention not only to um, what's happening, right, with what you're drawing. Also, pay attention to the negative space, which is the space between the objects, which we need to consider <clears throat> okay. when we're doing. See those spaces? Yeah. Yeah, you need those need to be here. Do I have them? Yes, I do. Thank God. I really hate it when I tell you to do something and then I haven't done it myself. In this particular case, <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> so, Jonathan, are you playing in a, a lot now? Are you getting out? Is it all starting to open up? In, uh, in fits and starts, yeah. <laughs> and we, I had gone about a year and a half with not having any gigs. Um, and then we started kind of playing again, I guess in the beginning of June, maybe I started having a couple gigs and then have played a variety of uh, private parties. I played at a, a music festival in Washington last weekend. Awesome. Uh, I've got a gig somewhere tonight and then a gig tomorrow. But, you know, and then things are, you know, we had kind of a standing every week gig and then they're going, it sounds like they're wanting to pause it for a little bit because, you know, it, it, it wound up being an inside gig and now that they're concerned that, you know. Yeah. In Oregon, we're, there's been a huge surge of Delta. Yeah. Uh, Rashmi has been dealing with this in India for a while now. Sure. Um, and we are now, um, and, I'm, and even that we have 70% vaccination rate, but like, the people who aren't getting vaccinated, we, we can still transmit it. Yeah. Um, so it's problematic. Yeah, I know it's really fits and it's kind of it's kind of nuts. Uh, my boyfriend is a stagehand and he does a lot of work with um, the zoo concerts and also Edgefield. Cool. Uh, so Edgefield is supposedly going forward, but everybody in the theater, like the inside things, is kind of they're like saying fall, but I think they're. No, I am not seeing any announcements yet. I don't yeah, know about I'm anticipating it kind of going backwards, not forwards. Yeah, me too. Sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, things, things should be worse. They are, they are, they are first, first world problems, as I call them. Well, I don't know. They're actually world world problems. <laughs> I, mean, I meant me not being able to play banjo at, at a gig because <laughs> that, that's not the, the biggest deal. Right, right. Is that what you play, banjo? No, I, play all sorts. I play banjo, I, I do play violin and guitar and piano and all sorts of stuff also, but mostly, oh, wow. mostly gig as a banjo player. That's awesome. And bluegrass. That's really yeah, cool. bluegrass being a very loose term, I play all, all sorts of classical and klezmer and blues and jazz and all sorts of uh, things. Um, but most, mostly playing kind of bluegrass related bands. Right. Okay, Annika, I want you to look at your um, sail and notice this sail is smaller than this sail. Now I want you to measure your sail mm. and see what's happened. This line needs to come, this mast needs to come to the one third point. Right? Yeah. So you need to move it. 
Better to move it now than later. Notice how easy it is to get too big, too small. Notice how easy it is to make things, um, to be so focused on the thing that you're drawing that you're not thinking about the thing next to it. So our job is to kind of think about this like a jigsaw puzzle. The negative space, which is the space between the object is as important, right? Uh, the comparison of this to this, getting these proportions right is as important as anything else. So it's an interesting, um, it's easy when you're looking at something to just be trying to draw that and not even focused on what's happening over here, but those things are important too. And they'll give you clues as to how it's going. So notice when you're focusing on one thing, that's when we tend to make it too big. When you're focusing, if you're thinking sail, uh, bottom of the boat, uh, you know what I mean? If you're thinking that, that tends to be better to like think less about what a thing is and more about this shape in relation to this shape, right? In relation to this shape, in relation to these shapes. It's hard. We're not used to, this is the visual way of thinking. And it's the visual logic. And we are not used to using that. We're used to using our left brain, which is about language, attaching words to concepts. Some of you are doing double duty on this because you're speaking more than one language. Um, Tosh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, still bring this out just a touch more, honey, on this side, a little bit out further. See, look at the relationship between your person, right? Here, I'm going to draw a triangle. Of where there is a person. You can see it, right? So look at, even, see, I can even draw a triangle to show what that space looks like, even if it's not actually in the, you know, I'm not actually sketching it into the drawing. Relationships. Leah, I'm going to say something really obvious, but I noticed. What's that? that I, I realized that when I take a photo of it to send it to you, it's the same thing as like taking a step back and looking at the photo. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So um, you know, I guess I could do that one. Right, so the moment you take the picture of it, you're like, wait a minute, I know. Well, that's one of the values of working online like this. Um, also, I'm not in the studio with you, so I can't wrap your fingers with the knuckles, nor can I take your wish. <laughs> <laughs> like I really do that. I wouldn't do that. Um, but like, you're, yeah, you're in a position to kind of correct your own, like to figure out the corrections yourself, which is important, right? Like I could, it's very easy for me in the studio to come in and just do it for you. And that doesn't help. So, so this is a better way, I think, in terms of pushing your own skill. Uh, I need a, just a little bit more coffee, you guys. So I'm going to go, I'll be right back while you're working on this. I'm not far. That's a nice idea. What's that? I, that sounds like a nice idea. I've just begun drinking coffee again. Oh, how is it? Are you loving it? Well, so I uh, completely stopped for six months and then I began again. And then I found it was like a bit too much. I was kind of getting too easily annoyed. Yeah. And so I stopped, but now I talked to my dietitian yesterday and she said, actually, coffee's good. So I'm now drinking it again. And but suddenly you, know, you want the, some. Get the I, best coffee ever, right? Like make it part of the ritual. Like, uh, yeah, I went for two years without drinking coffee and then realized I took such pleasure in it. I love the smell of it. Um, in, in Portland, we've got like so many amazing roasters, just incredible roasters. I mean, in Portland, it's like wine, right? Like it does a lot of good benefits. Yeah, you and a lot of antioxidants are supposed to be good for you. Right, stuff, right. So like that. And my, I, I highly recommend that you try the Ethiopian beans. I love them myself. Uh, I like. Uh, I'm left with the fruit on them. 
They're like Ethiopian. Is that uh, Arabica or Robusta? No. What? What's your favorite roaster around here, Leah? Oh my God, such a great question. I've got two and I'm on a subscription. So Marigold is one of them and uh, Heart Roasting is the other. And it's it like both of them sent, like the tasting notes on their beans are-, are Sorry, so I'm, you cut off for a second, I missed that. What did you oh, say? Sorry, Marigold Coffee and okay. heart, heart Roasting. Heart roasting. Okay, I haven't heard of either of those actually. Oh my God, what's your favorites? Who do you use? Uh, I, um, we, what is that? Um, sorry, Stump. We tend to buy. I tend to just get Stumptown a lot because that's what they have at the that's what they have at the grocery store. We we have an espresso machine, so I I make espresso. Right. I do too. Yes. Um. So, but I'm, I'm more than happy to try other stuff. I'll have to get your recommendations at some point. Check this out. Look at this. This is Hart's brand. Okay. They're Ethiopia. Ethiopia, they sent me Let's see, Let's see Hold on. Here it is. The oh. Ethiopia that they sent last week, uh, last month, has a totally this different is... flavor. This one has tangerine, palm sugar, and lilac. And mm. I swear to God, if you open the bag and you smell the bean. Oh, all those things. No, all those things. It's amazing. So that's that's a that's a mail order company, like a subscription service? Yes, it's a subscription service, but they do have at least one location uh, on Burnside, I want to okay. say. They do have a location on Burnside, but um, but but what's really awesome about them is that they they really work seasonally with their different beans. So they work to bring out all of the different things in their beans. Um, actually, we had a, a roast. I have an Airbnb at my house. We have a roaster come stay with us, a guy who works for one of the big roasters. And he tried this stuff and like his eyes rolled back into his head. <laughs> this is good. If you like this shit, they are so good. I don't happen to have any marigolds, but heart is, it's so good. <laughs> Oh, I'm learning all sorts of stuff today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you know who the other one is, John, who's in our neighborhood, is um, if you go to No Wave Coffee on Portsmouth Avenue. Um, really? Yeah, so Portsmouth and Long. There's yeah, a yeah, you're in the green building? Yeah, in the green building. There's a little coffee shop called- Yeah, uh, I see that. I drive by that all the time. I was literally yesterday, I drove by, I was like, man, I should really stop and go there sometime. You should, it's <laughs> great. It's amazing to me. There's a Starbucks just down the street that people line up for, and I'm like- yeah, I, 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 I'm, I know, I know. You know, the best coffee is like just right over here and there's no line, but anyway, he also uses a roaster um, who has some amazing blends um, and you can buy the beans from him as well. And they're <laughs> really good. I'll uh, go check that out. I will definitely try that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sorry, guys, we just went off on a tangent. Like, Sandra, are, what beans are you using? <laughs> I'd love to know. All right, Rashmi, much better. Great. Gosh, good. Excellent, you guys. There you go, Annika. It's I'm going to rotate it. It's still looking, no, no, no. I mean, listen. Okay, hold on, oh, damn it. There's something that happens when you take the picture sideways. It's a little trickier for me. Yeah, I, I rotated it now, I think. Now I can rotate it. I figured out how to rotate it here, hold on. Okay. Uh, rotate, I just have to rotate it. I don't know why mine come up sideways because I'm trying to take them straight, you know? Okay, so you still have the same problem, honey. You have not moved your mast over to the I top. have. I just moved it an inch. I you have not moved it far enough. You'll mm -hmm. see if you you will see one two. You will see that you need to be one third. This is one third, and this is two. You need to move it farther. You need to move it farther. Right now, this mast and this mast are the same size, and this one is smaller. Or this sail, sorry, this sail. This sail is smaller than this sail. Yours looks like a teepee, right? 
like a straight up. Uh, yep, you got it, baby. Okay, so let me. All right, so I'm going to move this. I feel like you guys have the picture. So those of you who are still in the drawing phase. Can deal with this. Oh, I love this. Definitely, what color blue are we definitely going to be working with, you guys? Any ideas, thoughts on this? Phthalo? Yeah, absolutely. Phthalo blue is going to be huge in this piece. And maybe Prussian blue, if you don't have phthalo. Phthalo, a beautiful kind of greenish, cool blue is definitely going to be part of this piece. Um, right now, I'm taking my little, I'm trying to see, okay, while you're looking at this, I wanted to show you what I'm doing over here. I've got my tray. I have tubed watercolor. If you're using pads, that's fine. Um, sometimes you have to do this with pads too. I'm, I'm just taking a paper towel with water in it and cleaning out the old paint. Because, you know, as you're, particularly in the yellows, because we do a lot of mixing, and things get mixed up and I want my, my little plates to be clean. Uh, if you're working with paths, you're gonna want a place to mix. So you might, if you don't have a, a tray like this, you maybe want, um, I don't know, maybe a dish, maybe, a, maybe an actual literal <clears throat> like saucer or something. I love this piece. You can get it at the art store down the street from my house. It's just, $10, it folds up like this. It's so teeny and it's awesome and it has room for lots of things. It can kind of be thrown in anywhere. And I love it. I just love it. Um, okay. And then let's talk about brushes for a second. And I'm gonna add up my screen here. Where am I? I'm gonna add you myself here so you can see my setup as well, um, just quickly. So I'm working on a drawing table and you can see here. So there's my drawing and my painting and here, ah, yes, there we go. Here's my little water cup with my brushes. Um, and I'm going to remove this now so we can talk about brushes and brush size, all that stuff. Um, you guys are probably sick of hearing this. I like to start a lot of brushes with uh, a paintings with um, a kind of bigger, not bigger, but like a lot of people at the beginning, I think one of the things, let, let me back up. When you're a beginner and you don't know what to do first, your tendency is to grab a brush like this right, and panic, right, because you think, I can control this, this is small. Um, the beauty of watercolor is that I can do one stroke, watch this, I'm just going to take basic ultramarine blue, I can do one stroke, right, and that's beautiful, like, there's so much texture here, uh, I dip it in water, I do it again, there's so much texture there that a lot of the work of my creating, I don't know, texture for, um, uh, uh, it just does a lot of the work for you. So even though you can't exactly control it, you have to allow, you have to work with a bigger brush to be able to get the kind of marks that you want. If I, I can't do that with this brush. If I do this with the brush, I do that. That's not the same thing. Right? There's not that much texture in there. Look at the difference between these two. So I like to work with both, but I like to have, I start with the big one and then I keep the little one when I need to start getting more detail. <clears throat> so just to see the comparison for size, I like to do. So my recommendation is to get kind of a, I, and I like to work flat. This is really specifically because, I don't know, because I love working, because the mark making that I adore is uh, choppy. If you look at all of my work, you'll see there's a slightly choppy look to it. Now that doesn't mean that your What's work- What's a choppy mark? A choppy mark is like blocky. It's like, uh, let's see if I can show you. Thick, you mean? It's like, it's like this. Like some people paint really smooth. We can't see. Oh. Who are you painting? 
play it really smooth like this, right? right? I like to do this. I like to build my 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 um, mark making tends to be more blocky. Okay. Right? Neither one is right or wrong, right? But so when you're working with a teacher like me, I'm going to give you the preferences. I have over the years discovered the tools that will do what I want to do. Why am I telling you that? Because you might start off with my tools, but you might find you'll find as you go along you have a way of mark making and the sort of joys in the experimentation you're great at that Sandra you're great at like figuring out there's a particular kind of mark I want to make and what brush do I need to get it so I guess I'm just encouraging you to got a new fantastic brush by the way yeah show us old oh. it's called where, where's the camera here it's I'm called... gonna add you in hold on where are you here you are. Hold on. Hold that up. Oh, I love it. It's so oh, dear foot. It's called dear foot. See, it's like a, yeah. and it's fantastic for hair, maybe grass, but mainly for me, you know, I want to do fur. Water, for watercolor? I don't know. I saw it. It's a Princeton Select dear foot three eights. And uh, I saw it in a um, watercolor video and it seemed absolutely, I love it right, for fur. Yeah. I don't know where it's. I love it. So yes, so we can share as we go along with these ideas. Um, uh, anyway, so you've got your brush. Notice that I have a little bit of room for testing up here. In fact, I'm probably even going to take another. I'm using, by the way, Arches Hot Press. Um, I like a smoother surface. Uh, you do not have to use this type of paper. You can use whatever you want. I like a heavier paper, so it's 140 pound or 300 grams, right? And it's hot press. And it's also something called satin, which means that it's really, really, it's, oh, that's it's, hot super, press. it's super smooth. The Some people, if you use cold, and basically that's just, if you use a cold press, your, your paper's gonna be bumpier. If you think about, I don't know if you've ever seen how paper is made, but basically you take little pieces of pulp and you strain them together and then they dry. So um, if you, when you're making watercolor, if you're kind of straining these pieces together and you don't flatten it with something warm, it has a bumpier texture. Um, you know, some people like the bumpy texture. Like it, it also adds texture. I tend to not so much, but I would highly, and, and you know, you could- Oh, be and by the way, sorry, Leah, I think a, a hot press that you like is much better for gouache. Yeah, hot press is good for gouache, but I've used it for watercolor too, and I love, yeah, yeah, the hot press. It's actually, uh, it's got a huge following. People saying actually uh, it's sometimes harder, but uh, it gives much more vivid colors. It does, that's right, because things aren't sinking into the back so much. You're absolutely right. So I'm actually gonna cut a little piece off of this paper because it is expensive. You can also totally use the, you know, I don't know, your kid's watercolor paper, but right? it's probably 90 <laughs> pound. It's probably something you got at the grocery store. I don't like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I'm trying, we're really trying to set this up so that you use what you have um, and then you, you kind of go from there. Um, and by the way, speaking of using what you have, any of you who are coming to tomorrow's beginning drawing class, we are moving to charcoal so and newsprint. So that's going to be the demo. And I haven't exactly decided what we're going to draw yet. I was going to do that after class today. So, but we are definitely moving, probably enamel. But we are definitely moving to a new medium. You are welcome to come in, as I said, and use your pencil or whatever. But if you happen to have those materials, that's really great. Okay. Oh, Sandra, I love not, I haven't finished the eyes and everything and He's the whiskers. Great. He's looking great. Annika, there you go. You got it. You got it. You got it. You all be here. Oh. Tosh, you gave your sister the chocolate cake. <laughs> That's great. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is the acrylic painting that Tosh Wing did for her sister. There is a story about chocolate cake that goes with Thank it. Thank you everyone for your help. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, I'm gonna send you a picture of this cool. color. 
That's wonderful, Tasha. It looks great. Did she love it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks delicious. I feel like the baby thought it was real. I'm going to pretend like he thought it was real. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Are you back home now or are you still with them? Um, I'm still in Michigan. I'm in my parents' house now and I'm going to go back to New York tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm going to miss class tomorrow. But then after that, I'm back on my, you'll have to see me all the time again. All right. Come as much as you want. Um, Aaliyah, I don't have a halo blue in watercolor or gouache. So what can I use? What have you got? Tell me what you got. I have cerulean, cobalt, ultramarine, Prussian. What's the Prussian? Prussian will, you can use all of those. Cerulean will work, uh, Prussian will work. Um, uh, um, what else did you say? You have cerulean will be helpful, Prussian. You might mix in a little green, right? Uh, like as you go, we'll just start uh, mixing. All right, enough nonsense. We've gone an hour and 15 minutes. We haven't even painted. You're like, what the hell is this a painting class or what? So, okay. So I have my testing paper down here. I have my, get this up higher. There we go. I put this down here so you can see some of the mixing that's going to start happening. Yeah, that'll work. Oh, sorry, Sandra. I still have you. So oh, sorry. Adding this. <laughs> We're spotlighting you so we can all see exactly what you're doing. By the way, that um, that piece that you're working on makes me, I was thinking this morning about um, being an artist professionally and how when I was a kid, there was a book called, you know what, I'll tell you this after we get started. I will tell you this. Your piece is reminding me of something that was really important for me in deciding I wanted to be an artist. Okay, so this is a very, very uh, blue piece, but a lot of these blues are in shadow. So what we know about shadows is that when we're starting, and we're going to start with the darkest colors, uh, I'd like you to work with phthalo blue or maybe for you, uh, um, if you don't have phthalo blue, let me know and I'll, we'll discuss what you have. For you, Rosh, you can go ahead and um, mix Crushing with a little bit of cerulean. Okay. Leah, I only have cobalt blue and primary primary blue. Try cobalt. Try cobalt. cobalt. And okay. you might have to add a little bit into it, but we'll just see. Um, so as you know, when we're mixing a shadow of something, and just to remind you, I pulled up the what did I do with this? Right. Well, anyway, you can you can see the black and white. Pull out the black and white, and I don't know what I. Oh, here it is. If you look at this, you're gonna see. Let's let's return to our values before we get started here. But sometimes it can be confusing. Let's review values very quickly. So the values of this piece. When I say value, I mean the lightness or darkness of any color. If one is light and five is super dark. Two, three, and four are what we call mid-tones. They're gradually getting you know, darker, right? So I would say these little splashes here are ones. Whoops. I'm gonna give you this. This is like a one. And like back here, the clouds are kind of ones, maybe the sky. We're going to decide how detailed we want to get with the sky. So nothing in here. This is a one. So and then this little thing is a one. And then there's this little splashy one right in there. These guys, these guys are the most important things to keep in mind as ones. Everything else is darker than that, right? So we have to decide. I say this is like a three. And this is a five. And you can tell because when you look at them, one looks darker than the other. Um, and so the question becomes, what is the color of the base of the boat? What would you say on the value scale of this? Does anybody have a guess as you're looking at this? What's the, 
What's the color? What's the value of the color? How dark is it? Three. Yeah, I'd say like a three, maybe a two and a half to a three, right? It's slightly lighter than what's happening here. So maybe this is like a three and a half, and this is a three, right? This is a good thing to keep in mind, and maybe this is like a three or a, or a two to three, right? And then there's a two. Really, that's a three because this is a two. Right. So as you're starting to go across and, and start to associate color with value, you want to make sure as you lay things down that they have. And with watercolor, of course, the way to get value, here, I'll take a picture of this. So you guys have. With watercolor, the way to get value is to use more water. So you're going to dip your brush in water to get things lighter. Um, so because much of this boat is in shadow because the light is actually literally behind it, right? You can't see the sun, but it's kind of above and coming down. You can see because the shadow is coming this way. Um, we're going to start with the shadow and the the sort of side of the boat. Um, shadow blues always have a little bit of complement in them. So whatever blue you're starting with, you're going to have a little testing piece here. Um, you're going to add a tiny touch of burnt sienna into your blue. I think. Not too much. You want it to read as more blue than um, not. But look at the difference. So there is a shadowy color with some burnt sienna in it. Here is the color without. You see the difference? So this is a grayish blue because it's in the shadow. So my shadows will always have a little bit of the complement mixed in with them. And if I want to make this kind of slightly watery, I dip, I you know, mix it and then I dip it in water once or twice. So look, as I continue to dip it in water, it gets lighter. Remember that with watercolor, if you go too dark, you can't go back. So our challenge is to kind of build our darks up. So I have, and you'll see, now I have a little bit. So I have some phthalo blue, a touch of burnt sienna to make it kind of, it's a little bit greener. I'm testing it. I think this is a pretty good value. I can always darken it. So I'm not so, and in fact, I can even go down in here into this dark and add this color again. Um, however, I do want to avoid getting any color in these light splashes. So see how I'm working around them? In reality, I can also take this color and bring it down here into the shadow, working around the lights into the biggest shadow color. Because I can layer up colors, but I can't layer down. My shadow goes a little bit longer because this is kind of a square photo. Um, can I come up here? I'm going to try something. Let's see. On another section, I'm going to try. Do you all have ultramarine blue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So over here on the, I really noticed like the sea is very green and kind of a cooler blue. But do you notice on the shadows up here, it's a little bit, the tone is different. So we're going to try mixing for the shadow of the, uh, uh, sales, we're going to try mixing ultramarine blue, which is oops, here, ultramarine blue, which is an entirely different blue. Look at that. The difference between these blues is, is very, the ultramarine blue is almost purple. It's got more red in it, really. The phthalo blue is green. It's got more green in it. Um, so I'm going to take some ultramarine blue and I'm going to try a touch of first in it, see what happens. Maybe get a slightly different Oh yeah, I like that. So I like this variation. 
So for my sale up here, I'm going to start with, so notice I'm kind of moving around the shadows, shadowy areas first. I'm going to use this color. Now I know I'm going to have to get darker. And I know within kind of these sails, this dark area, there's lighter and darker parts. So I'm starting very light. And interestingly enough, this sail looks almost yellow to me. So we might try a different gray mix for this. Interesting. And I see a little bit of this blue, this kind of gray color coming in here. I think because the, the sail is kind of, this part of the sail is reflecting onto here. Whereas the water, which is greener, is kind of reflecting onto the boat from this side. I mean, that looks really green. So I may adjust this as I add, add top layers. You know, I said what we're doing here is a, a grisaille painting, right? I'm leaving this areas, these areas light, which is kind of a grayscale painting as we start to do it. And we're going to go to a different color to the sky. Everything is like this is just all like different blues. Sorry, Leah, did you do the um, sail out of ultramarine? Yeah, ultramarine and a little bit of burnt sienna, just a touch. So this is the, this part of the boat is phthalo blue and a little bit of burnt sienna, or cobalt and Prussian, or some combination of those and burnt sienna. This is ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And look at the difference. And it can be this light. And then here, I'm looking at that. That is like, God, I almost want to try a couple of things. I'm gonna try mixing, it's so yellow. I'm gonna try mixing like yellow ochre and purple. Let's see what happens. Probably isn't gonna work. So I'm not going to get you too caught up in this exercise I'm doing, but if you want to see. And as, like, and as I said, I am not, I am intentionally not practicing these because I want you guys to see my trial and error, right? That's important. It's real easy for a teacher to come up and practice something and then teach it perfectly and then make you feel like, well, hell, I don't know how to paint, right? But painting is a lot about experimenting. I don't think I like this. I don't know, actually. Let's see. Now I'm going to try. I have my, my trusty testing thing here. So I can kind of see how things work. So We rarely use phthalo blue, it's so crazy. This whole painting is phthalo, it's kind of interesting to me. Or I never use phthalo blue, I find it really an intent, a wonderful color, but super intense. You gotta be ready for, for anything with phthalo blue. Let's try it. Now that might be, now it's too cool. Weird. So my original idea. Here, hold on. I'm working it out. I'll let you guys know. Nope, oh, needs more. Okay. <laughs> so this other sale, so I feel like it's that song in Sesame Street, right? One of these things is not like the other. That's how the mixing is for this sale. Uh, go ahead and show me what you've got here, though, color-wise. I'll make sure you're not going too dark. Send it across. 
And I know we started a little bit late, so we've got about half an hour. I'm happy to go a little longer if people don't finish. And Sandra, what I wanted to tell you about your drawing was, your painting, is that one of the books I was read as I read as a child was a book about a little, I can't remember, I think it's called The Golden Slippers. And uh, it's about the Easter Bunny. Okay, pretty good, Tosh. Be careful not to get too dark. You layer those darks in, right? Because you can't get darker. I think you're okay. Um, so it looks like you reversed this, Claudia. Would you, is this the blue? Is this your primary blue? And this your cobalt? Yes. Okay, so in future layers, bring your cobalt up to this section and your primary blue down here. Okay. To get that green. Yeah, it's hard for me to know. Uh, Julia, that looks good. Good job, you guys. Let's see. Okay, John, you went uh, heavy, like super dark. So here's my yeah. recommendation. Take your, uh, here, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna add quickly. I want you to get a paper towel. I forgot to mention, right, the blankie, which is your rag or your paper towel. I want you to get it wet. And then I want you to tap off. So just know you need a lot of, you probably need to dip your brush in the water several times. Now I'm going to switch back to my tablet so you can see what I'm going to do with it, which is I'm going to come in and scrub out, see, as much of that paint as I can. From where, from the sail or the water or the boat or what? Everywhere, it's just way too dark. Everything is dark. So I would say, just go over the whole thing, scrub it off so that you've got, so that you're like, you're a five right here. And the only thing that's five is here, right? And here, everything else should be lighter than that. So you wanna scrub off all the paint. You're not gonna get it all off, but I want you to scrub it back. It's okay. The easy watercolor mistake uh, to make, you make it once usually, and then you never make it again. Uh, Raj, I think this is for you. Bring a little bit more, um, uh, scrub in a little bit more off here, off your sail here. It's okay in the boat, but the sail is a little bit dark. So scrub off. Um, yeah, I couldn't see the color difference, so that's why I just put a second layer on it. That's why yeah, it, it, it went, you went too dark, honey. So pull it back a little bit. Also, too heavy. Notice there's little light, right? The second layer, there's little pieces in here. I want you to look closely. Um, these split decisions that you make in watercolor will rule you right? They're going to control everything else you do for the rest of the painting. So lighter is better until you absolutely know it. Right? It's okay. And like I said, I would highly recommend. Um, and Emma, I like this attempt you made over here. I'm going to go a little bit yellower. On, I don't know what you mixed to get this color, Emma Thomason. I don't know what you mixed. I'm going to work, I'm going to suggest a slightly more complex mix. Of course, you can do what you want. Nobody ever has to do anything I tell them to at all. Totally don't have to do anything I tell you to. <laughs> uh, the way, the color I like the most is a little bit yellower. So I was going to suggest starting with a touch of bamboge or yellow ochre. Kind of a mustardy yellow color. And then you're going to mix ultramarine blue and alizarin and crimson to make a purple. So you see, I'm doing that over, whoops, you can't really see it here. Hold on. So I'm doing two things. Actually, maybe you should mix your, let's do this. Mix your purple first. So you're mixing ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. So I've got a kind of purpley color here, bluish purpley color. And then I'm gonna add gamboge to it. So it has a kind of a grayish purpley cast. Kind of yellowy. Yeah, weirdly, 
If it feels too gray, add a touch more yellow to it. So the yellow dominates more. You can see. So I'm going to suggest that combination for here. Test your test your colors out on your on your thing before you go. You said you said owls are in crimson. What? Uh, owls are in crimson, ultramarine blue to make a purple, and then you're going to add some yellow ochre or gamboge yellow. Both of those things would work for this sale. And test it first. And this is a super light sail. So a lot of water, so much water. Look how light this is. Super, super light. It's a two in the fields of ones and threes. Mm -hmm. Good. Here, I'll, um, I'll even write it down. Uh, I'm gonna, here it is. Olives are in crimson, and I'll take a picture of it and send it over. Here is ultramarine blue. Oops. Equals purple. So the general rule, John, which you don't know as much, but which I'm obsessed with here when I talk to these guys, is complementary colors. Do you know anything about that? Uh, not really a whole time. Okay, so I'll talk to you about it. I'm going to hammer it into you. You're going to hear it so much that you're going to ignore me. <laughs> I talk about it so much. Complementary colors are the three. Uh, well, hold on. I'll get there in a second. I just want to. Hold on. So here it is blue and uh, owls are crimson making purple plus a little bit of yellow. And that makes this color. I'll talk about that in a second. I will review. Anybody want to say what are complementary colors? Complementary mm -hmm. color pairings? Anybody remember? Orange and blue. What's that? Orange and blue are complementary colors. Great. What else? Purple and yellow. What is it? Purple and yellow. Purple and yellow. And then what? Purple and yellow, I said. Yep. And then what's the last one? Red and green. Right. Excellent. So. This is what we're going for. So. This is how it works, complementary colors, just a very quick. Well, you guys are mixing this. Let's show it. If you're looking at a color wheel like this, the primary colors, the colors of which all colors are made from, are yellow, blue, and red. Right? This is your basic primary colors. Now, of course, there are warmer reds and, and cooler reds, warmer blues, cooler blues, warmer yellows, cooler yellows. But essentially, that's that. If you mix yellow and green, uh, yellow and blue together, you get green. Right? If I mix a little bit of blue with a little bit of yellow, I get a green color. It doesn't really look very green. I've got other things going on on this palette, right? And if I mix blue and red together, I get purple. And if I mix red and yellow together, I get orange. Get orange. So these make up the primary and the what we call the tertiary colors. The colors that are exactly across the wheel from each other on this color wheel. That's that's purple and yellow, blue and orange, red and green are complementary colors. 
thing you need to know about complementary colors. Red, green, blue, orange, purple, yellow. So the thing to know about complementary color pairings is that if you put them next to each other, like so, you will pop, the colors will pop each other forward. They pop. Like these two colors, if you put them next to each other, they pop, which is why you see a lot of sports teams with purple in high schools, with purple and yellow or blue and orange or even red and green. Right, but when you mix them together, you get a kind of gray. So when you mix the complements together, you get a gray thing. When you put them next to each other, they pop each other forward, both push forward. So when you're trying to mix a gray, you're looking at the gray, the, the, the color of the gray and thinking, what is the complement? that I need to mix it. Burnt sienna is considered both a red and an orange. So it can be used kind of indiscriminately uh, as both of those things, just depending. And so that's the sort of basic color theory. I'm gonna take a picture of this. Do not worry, I'm not gonna test you on it. You don't have to remember it. I'm just reminding you that this is like the basis for all of the color mixing. Always mixing a complement. All right, definitely, and speaking of, definitely here in this sky, I see ultramarine blue. I see a kind of a slightly purpley, looks like a lot of purple. Deep purple, I want this more blue. Sort of easy to get too much of one thing in there. There we go. Just a tiny bit of red on my brush and blue. I'm going to take yellow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's actually right. I don't actually have cerulean blue. I have something called turquoise. So let's try that. Blue and a little bit of orange. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And still, I'm looking at the sky here. So you might want to try a little cobalt and some and a touch of orange in it. Definitely you want an ultra, you want a cooler, you want a warmer blue. So whichever of your blues looks less green, you're gonna want a little bit of that. And as we go into the sky here, what is the color mix for the sail on your left? Ah, that is um uh that is a uh, blue and red a cool red so a crimson over a cadmium um mm -hmm. plus a little bit of yellow yeah both so i'm just taking I'm adding a little bit of blue into the sky here, but not too much. In fact, I'm probably gonna do no more than that. I don't think we really need it. We're just gonna be focusing on the boat. And yes, don't hesitate to ask me uh, again if you need to know what the mix is. So what did you make for the sky again? 
Uh, it's just a little bit of any blue you like with a touch of orange, but not too much. You can just be That's any orange. Orange as in burnt sienna? Yeah, yeah, orange, but not too much, right? And very light. See how light that is? That's like yeah, so yeah. light. You could use cobalt, you could use cerulean, you could use turquoise. In truth, you could maybe do anything you want to with this. I'm not even really getting too far with that. All right. And then a couple of other things I can do with my darker uh, color. I can go back to this blue, darker blue orange mix. Use either a phthalo or ultra. Uh, Maybe ultramarine blue and burnt sienna is better for this. Now this is quite a dark color. So I'm gonna run it in here using the side of my brush. Notice I'm leaning a little bit on my canvas. This is the five. Sorry, that's me. I'm oh, sorry. Then we mute myself. This is the darkest color. So I'm gonna bring that in here. And also down here, working around, I still may have to layer. Right? Sorry, what was the mix again? Uh, ultramarine blue and um, burnt sienna. I'm bringing that in down here too. So see, now I'm layering my darts, and I know that my Right. This is the darkest. This strip here is really the darkest part. So my little white areas are staying light. And when I mix a little bit more phthalo blue with maybe just a touch of burnt sienna, right? As I try to come down here and use my shadows, I want to make sure that my water is not as dark as this. So my water needs to get darker, particularly in these shadow areas. Also, it's particularly dark right here. So I'm now just kind of layering fatal blue in on top. But I want to make sure that my phthalo blue, my water is not darker than this. The darkest thing of this boat is this kind of strip here. So that is ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, very heavy and dark. So is this mass here. It can be in here too, if you get your brush to go that small. Kind of come in here at the bottom. There's a little bit of blue here in the windows. If you want to wait and do that with your smaller brush, you also can. See how little actual dark there is. Everything else is lighter. My brush. I'm also going to take variations of lighter phthalo blue and maybe mix it with um, 
if you've got cerulean, you can use this. If you've got cobalt, you can do this. Sort of lighter blues, right, around the edge of your boat. And see how I'm using my brush. I'm using a lot of water. I'm letting my brush kind of, so I'm using a kind of turquoise -y blue in here. Notice how much texture my brush gives. Also, notice what happens. I can't really get rid of this edge unless I make this as dark, right, as this. That's why we don't want to go too dark too soon. So this could be cerulean blue you're using. Notice everything's kind of darker towards the front and it gets gradually lighter. So this line is kind of this medium. bluish color. I haven't even mixed any anything in it. I'm just using like whatever my kind of light medium blue color is. It's really in cobalt, turquoise, whatever you got. And then when I get to here, I'm going to water it down even more and do an even lighter strip. So you can see here, it gets darker and it gets lighter as you go kind of further back. Now I can start coming in and building up my darks in my sails. So once again, in, in any of the shadow areas, I'm still mixing a little bit of the complement. So you're mixing in a little bit of burnt sienna in with your blues as you start to get, oh, that's pretty dark. Do I want to go that dark? Hold on, where's my blankie? I can pull this off a little bit. See, I can still have a little bit of time. To, to dip my brush back in the water. Yeah. Now, I can notice there's some kind of neat shadows here within this light area. There's this kind of rigging. Can you see that little shadow rigging happening? I'm using ultramarine blue and a little bit of burnt sienna here. As I'm starting to get in my darts, a little darker. And oops, still too dark. So notice, even I'm going a little too dark, even though I know better. So I'm noticing that within my dark, there's some nice variation. I can pick that up. Um, and there's even a, a couple, and I can go to my little brush for this. There's even a couple of kind of little shadows that come into this white area. There's a bottom mass, which seems to be slightly brown. So I'm using more burnt sienna, right? A little bottom mass here with sort of stable, slightly darker line here. Kind of a line down here like this. So as you start to build those darks up, there's some kind of lovely textures that happen. To get as detailed or not detailed as you want. We can also start to go down here and look at our darks. Our sky is pretty much dark. So I would do burnt umber and ultramarine blue. So notice all of my darkest darks are kind of burnt umber and ultramarine blue, uh, and sorry, burnt sienna. So I can come in here with the dark with my little brush. Notice it's just like kind of tubes. There's not too much detail to handle. This bit is a little bit brown, so you might do a uh, lightened and darkened burnt sienna. Maybe add in a little bit of gamboge to do these lightest yellow areas. It's sort of this kind of little 
painting if you've decided to paint that you also don't need to put that in if you're just focusing on the basics that's okay too oh yes and then this line up here is pretty dark also so sorry i'm just trying to get you enough stuff so you can get you can start to layer in colors we're gonna go about 15 minutes longer because i spent a lot of time yapping more than usual. I didn't even tell my bunny story yet, but I will. Notice how I'm kind of layering in darks over the light, but in this kind of loose way. So now my shadow's looking darker. It's got a kind of soft edge. I can also just go in with water kind of brush along the edge where one meets the other. I can start to darken this a little bit too. Go one layer darker with the boat. So you see how as I start to go in, and the last thing we're going to do is deal with gouache. So And see if you've got the little boat that's on the cover here. Here are some dark areas. Okay. Notice that as we get closer to the bottom, we can see some clouds in the sky. Clouds are also this same mix. The cloud, the bases of the clouds, the shadows of the clouds are this mix. Alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, even purple, add a little yellow, and you've got a base there. So if you want to add some clouds in, the same mix. Did I take a picture of this? Let me make sure I take a picture of this. And sent it over to you. So you've got it. Like this kind of grayish purple color, which is what the shadows are. You might have to clean up your of one of your trays so that your mixes are more pure. They aren't like adulterated with the other colors. Ugh. That word pure has such a terrible like, connotation. Right. So now that I have this kind of shadow color in a very watery form. I can add in, I want to dip it like probably twice in water before I'm ready to do this. Um, right here at the base, it's kind of this soft blue. See how I'm darkening. water so it stands up against the sky. It's available for that. So it's blue. And then I can take some of this shadow color, this purple color. And if I want to, I can add in a few cloud shadows, which are the bottom of the clouds. I want to. And then kind of pulling those out. Is that still watercolor, Leah? Yeah, it's all watercolor. I haven't got to it. Look very nice. They look all right, right? Yeah. yeah I love uh, that blue with a yeah, sail. It's oh. blue, right? It's just that's the magic blue. That's like phthalo blue, red shade or green shade? Green uh, shade, right? Uh, just regular phthalo blue. I don't see a shade delineated, which means it's oh. probably like a mix with other things. 
There's probably some cobalt in there. But I know it's pretty, isn't it? Very pretty. Right. And it's okay. If you mop this up, it's okay. That's the whole point. We learn a lot from our mop ups, right? We learn a lot. Um, you could get more, you could get a little yeah. dark. And part of it with watercolor is, oh my God, I've got to go so much light, right, Sandra? Like, that's what you learn first about watercolor is, oh my God, don't go too dark because you just can't fix it. With a yes, then I did it again. <laughs> right? It's easy to do. With acrylic, you can totally do it. With yeah. acrylic, you can totally go dark, right? Diana's like, yeah, acrylic. I love acrylic. So as we're going through here, go ahead and like work on sort of your details and your values. My suggestion at this point is that this would be a good time to do gouache. Where is the gouache tray? If you don't have gouache, that's okay. I'm gonna add yet another set of colors, uh, a set of material in the mix. So uh, Claudia, to answer your question, Gouache is literally a combination of um, it's it's a it's it's like absolutely between watercolor and acrylic. It's not as opaque as acrylic, right? You, but you can layer. But it's a it's a little bit more opaque than watercolor. So it's a fantastic uh, paint to do finishing touches in watercolor on because I actually can lay a little bit of lighter colors on top of my darker ones. So you can see I'm using a tube. This is a tube of light gouache. <laughs> I'm going to put, I don't have very many gouache colors. So I'm going to put azul. I have this kind of color called azul blue, which probably looks a little bit like cerulean to you. Um, you put an azul blue? It's just called azul is what it's called. Just, uh, azul, azul. Azul, it's just blue, right? Right, right? It's not like, I've got a little bit of purple violet here, so I'm gonna put that in too. Um, so now as I go in with my whites, I can kind of brush little splashes of and you see I'm doing a kind of soft tap here. I'm taking some of this white tube paint. With, my brush is wet, but I'm not going into the water to add the kind of crests of these waves. And sometimes it's just easier to do that with gouache. Yeah, look at what that does. Uh, Tosh, we did a really beautiful, I'm adding in some white up here. So if you're, if you got your, um, if you're, uh, you got your thing too dark, your, your thing here, you can add little bits of white, like whiter color in here. It's also really fantastic for adding details with your little tiny brush. Let me show ya. I can take white here and I can add little tiny bits of white up here. I can add a little bit of white here. So you can go back in and add. Oh, did I freeze? Huh. What happened here? Sorry, did I freeze you guys?